Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, like uh, the panel was saying, now we look at the challenges that uh, we have in the water sector in agriculture with the increasing climate variability uh, generated by climate change. Uh, first of all, let's have uh, a little uh, look at um, what, are, what is the status of water resources in California uh, on an average year like 2010. Here you can see that when we put together both the precipitation and the import from the transboundary river, we have about 200 uh, million acre feet per year. Of these, 39 are for environmental use and uh, uh, agriculture has 33 um, million acre feet. So, but in total, we have that the annual, let's say total beneficial water use is around 8.5 million acre feet per year. Although, as we said, this is not a fixed amount, it changes from year to year, but on an average year, that's what we generally have. And the distribution of this water, the share of these water resources among the uh, various sectors is shown in this slide where you can see that the environment takes 49% of the um, total beneficial water use. And this is used for uh, rivers, uh, uh, in-stream flow, but also the one required to push back in the delta the intrusion of water uh, from the ocean. Uh, in addition to some managed, managed wetlands. Then agriculture, mostly irrigated, uh, essentially, takes 41%, while the remaining 10% is for the urban and uh, industry. Um, generally, these water resources that come from rainfall, but mostly from snow from the Sierra, and uh, the, the way generally is harvested all the runoff in, on 40% of the area in the north that uh, collect 90% of the water resources that then goes toward the, the south, uh, where the majority of the demand is central and south California, while most is harvested in the north. And of course, the distribution of this water occurs through different uh, uh, you know, project of uh, canal and, and uh, um, conduit. Uh, in addition to the fact there are a lot of reservoir also along the, the Sierra to collect the snow melt <coughs> from, from the Sierra Nevada. So aqueducts and, um, but we have also transboundary water, like we said, like the case of the Colorado uh, river and but also from the north coming from uh, Oregon. A couple of uh, area in, in uh, lower the delta, below the delta and in central California uh, uh, circled in red in this case are uh, isolated in terms of hydrological connection and uh, they are mostly based on uh, groundwater where it is uh, uh, available. Now we start to see that uh, the problem, one of the major problem, major challenges that we are having is about the variability. And drought is one of those, uh, you know, uh, events that comes periodically with some recurrence and so on. And uh, for instance, using this uh, drought severity index, uh, um, we see that, uh, for instance, that we had uh, several drought uh, between the 2014, 2015, 2016, and then we started to mile down in 2018, and particularly in 2019. Uh, but then again, the, the drought came uh, in, in 2021, and this was the situation, for instance, last September 2022. Then the rainfalls and uh, uh, you know, the snow melt arrived. Basically, we are already in February this year, we have that the situation of drought is basically uh, gone. And when we look, in fact, in March, we are in uh, uh, good condition now. Though this variability and somehow 
unpredictability of those occurrences is makes the planning of water resources, the allocation, always very, very challenges. Uh, another way to look at, uh, at the, this variability is to look at the snow melt from the Sierra. We have seen, we have said before that most of the precipitation uh, are coming under the form of snow. And here, for instance, we have the cumulative uh, um, precipitation from October to October uh, of the year along the, the reservoir of the Northern Sierra. The shaded area, uh, this shaded area represents the average of uh, almost 30 years and you can see that several years are below, others are above. This is the current case for this year. But this enormous variability is what uh, makes it very challenging to make the planning of the water resources. This is in the central Sierra. And here the, the difference, you see the same variability going above and below the uh, long term average. But you can see also how we go from the north to the south. This uh, um, precipitation cumulatively uh, are reduced. Um, we have heard a lot about the temperature increase and particularly uh, minimum temperature for the chilling factor, but also you have heard about the pollination implication. But for us is also an implication on the uh, supply distribution, but also on the crop water demand, the peak that keep changing in some and concentrating in some months. So the warmer temperature uh, during the winter um, provide, uh, let's say that uh, the precipitation goes mostly as a rainfall and less as a snow. Uh, we talked about the chill requirement that uh, is reduced. Uh, we have seen that the runoff, for instance, between April and June has been declined by 10% in the last century. And then also there is an important uh, occurrence, the shift of the peak of the snow melt. Basically here, you can see the snow melt waste of the Sierra Nevada in the first half of the uh, century, 1906-1955, the in red, and then in the second half of the century, 1956-2007, in blue, you can see that the peak has been shifted earlier in time. So this shift uh, prevent the fact that we have already the reservoir that should be, that are already in part full and they cannot be, be fooled more than their capacity, also for security reason and so on. So we lose some water of this snow melt if we, uh, the peak of the snow melt comes too much early in time. And in any case, we uh, have a projection that, uh, the, um, you know, this is the historical range until 1990 and when this one, while well, these are the projection. And if we look at the projection on the lower warming range uh, until 2099, we can see that we might lose 48% of this uh, snowpack. And then if we go instead of the worst scenario with a high warming range, we may lose 65% which is a, a quite uh, important um, losses uh, in, in prospect. The other point also to consider is the fact that we have the uh, continuous depletion of groundwater. Here is just the cumulative groundwater depletion in the Central Valley. And this starts already from the 60s. And we can see here, for instance, that there are also dry year, wet year, and during the dry year, the slope of the withdrawal is much steeper than then during the wet year when there should be some recharge of this groundwater. And, and this continuous trend in terms of uh, uh, depletion of groundwater uh, is uh, worrisome 
For instance, some concern are for Tulare Lake, South Coast and Colorado River areas, uh, basically where the groundwater level has declined of more than seven meter between 2011 and 2017. And this is also the reason why there is the establishment of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And this overimpose to the, to the restriction, let's say, in water availability uh, from climate. Uh, here, for instance, I want to just to report the Public Policy Institute in California releasing last month this policy brief on the future of agriculture in San Joaquin Valley. And there they clearly state that by 2040, average annual water supply could decline by 20% constrained chiefly by transition to groundwater sustainability under the sigma, but exacerbated also by the climate change and environmental regulation. So when we look at long term of water related implication, we can see that we continue to have population grow in California. We already reached the 40 million. Um, and uh, the implication of this that you need additional domestic production of food to, to satisfy the demand of this growing population. Also, we have seen, we have observed over the years that uh, more agricultural land, particularly also irrigated land, have been encro encroached by the urban uh, settlement. And so this uh, reduction in uh, agriculture and irrigated uh, good land uh, implies that we, the production will progressively move uh, uh, you know, in marginal land, in less fertile lands, with implication also for that you needed to compensate the lower, let's say, uh, fertility with additional inputs. In terms of uh, long-term trend of irrigated agriculture, we observe that there is an, in, an increasing concentration of the irrigated land. The most uh, uh, relevant area are San Joaquin Valley, Sacramento and Sac San Joaquin uh, Delta and the Imperial Valley. Consider that 35% uh, of the U.S. Uh, table food uh, is uh, uh, obtained basically on only about 1.2% of the U.S. farmland. So this is to say how much the concentration of irrigated agriculture is also occurring. Um, also, the cropping pattern is intensified. Conversion from annual to perennial, uh, like fruit nuts, crops like fruit nuts and vines, higher planting density and inputs, and shift from surface irrigation to macro Drip, drip and micro sprinkler irrigation. This is also the results of uh, a push by the uh, legislator from water agencies and regulators that uh, uh, intend to, by increasing the uh, efficiency of the irrigation system, to have uh, some water saving, water conservation, which most of the time doesn't mean that you, you can save uh, maybe a farm level but that water never leave the farm. Actually, the farmers may uh, extend or in, uh, their land, their irrigated land, or increasing the uh, um, intensity of their cropping system. So the, um, the trend now of the crop is that uh, both, I mean, in terms of ir irrigation, the um, gravity or surface irrigation is going down while is increasing the drip and uh, uh, subsurface. And also, like we see on the other graph, the crops like uh, field crops are decreasing while the orchards and vineyards are increasing. So higher productivity, higher productive crops. Um, but this means also requiring uh, better skills in irrigation scheduling and management. We talked about the uh, economic productivity of water by changing this uh, in this toward this crop like orchards type. We, uh, the uh, water productivity has been increasing from for instance $680 per acre feet of the 2000 year 
to $910 per acre feet of 2010. So there is a, a, a let's say a push toward the higher productivity and one of the aspect uh, that has uh, allowed this increase in water productivity is in fact moving toward a higher precision, let's say, uh, irrigation system like the, the one of uh, drip and, and uh, micro irrigation in general and moving a little from the surface one. So what to expect in the future is that uh, the water supply will be limited and more regulated for all users the water rights and water tariffs most likely will be need to be revisited. Larger quota of water are being transferred from agriculture to urban areas and the environment. Never forget that the environment already share a large quota. Um, and climate change and the increasing weather variability will worsen problem of water supply. And we don't have only drought and floods, but also we'll have other extreme events like frost and heat waves. So we need a cropping system that use less water, adapt to lower quality water also, uh, benefit from rainfall and flow capture during the fall and winter months. As we have seen, we needed to capture those water as much as possible in order to, to uh, benefit from uh, and not to lose that water runoff. And in terms of irrigation system, we, didn't, we need irrigation that are of high precision. Con so the, the trend will continue high precision because this allows to apply water with small amounts, frequent interval, so to deploy high application efficiency and uniformity. In a way, gives the opportunity to manage better the stress uh, of the plant. And we know that for nuts crop particularly, there are stages of the uh, orchard uh, of, during the season where they are less sensitive to water stress. So this will allow also us to use deficit irrigation. Deficit irrigation, which is the application of water below the full requirement of, uh, of evapotranspiration, provided of course you take care of the salinity buildup. So um, the deficit irrigation, which has been uh, proven to be uh, effective, at least in several other uh, countries, um, is a well versed to be used with the nuts crops. So this is something that can respond also to the management of uh, uh, irrigation under variability, assuming that you have the right allocation of water. Also, to use the prospect management strategies, making use of forecasting tools. So try to, we try to use also opportunity to forecast at least a couple of weeks in advance for the irrigation, for the scheduling of irrigation in order to better adjust and having this management strategy that can allow to cope with the variability of climate. Here, there are some useful links that uh, we would like to provide uh, when uh, the, the, the presentation will be distributed or will be accessible. And here you can find not only information on water resources, but also some uh, dedicated webinars on droughts and some uh, tip sheets that will uh, help to uh, manage better the drought. And with that, I think I will stop here and thank you for your attention. What research is being done on deficit irrigation? What? Yeah, there are several done. Also in California has been done in the past, but there are new research, also re most recent research done in Spain, done in Southern Italy, done also in, Calif in uh, Australia. So there are several of these uh, research studies that can be useful to adopt for, you know. Uh, now, how much experimentation is done by the cooperative extension on deficit irrigation, I don't know. Daniele, you know more? Uh, it's been done, uh, uh, there is some research done by David Goldhammer on pistachio and almonds during the late 90s. Uh, but the cropping system and, uh, and planting density varieties were uh, different with, with respect to what we have now. So probably 
it's about time to do it again. <laughs> yeah.